Welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast. If you are looking to refresh your parish choir's polyphonic repertoire and get some helpful insights into music that is both beautiful and works really well in parishes, we've got a great show for you today. Our guest is Dr. Aaron James, the Director of Music for the Toronto Oratory of St. Philip Neri, serving at Holy Family Church. And we talk about an exciting project he's working on for parish choirs and dive into a few perhaps lesser well-known gems of the motet repertoire. If you're looking for an even deeper dive into repertoire, techniques for running a rehearsal, warm-ups, performance practice tips, etc., I'd recommend to you the last two classes of our summer session this summer, 2022, at St. Joseph's Seminary, both of which are available online, as well as our recommendation of attending in person. In the mornings and afternoons from July 25th through the 29th, I'll teach a course which covers the things a choral director needs for success in directing a parish choir, warm-ups, rehearsal techniques, and accessible and approachable repertoire, which really fits the musical structure of the sacred liturgy. In the evenings of that same week, Professor Charles Weaver from Juilliard and CUNY will teach a class that covers the most important Renaissance choral composers, developing parish musicians' abilities to analyze, perform, and teach to parish choirs gems from the church's treasury of sacred music. He'll help students to develop an understanding of historical performance practice techniques that can helpfully inform the singing of amateur and professional singers alike. And those two courses are entitled Choral Repertoire and Practicum Parish Choirs in the Mornings and Afternoons, and then Professor Weaver's class, Renaissance Choral Repertoire, History, Analysis, and Performance Practice for Parish Musicians. More information is available at our website, www.dunwoody.edu, that's spelled D U N. W-O-O-D-I-E dot E-D-U and click on Dunwoody Music. And now on to our interview. Thanks so much for joining me today, Aaron. Yeah, great to be here. So last season, I had you on for a really great episode to talk about motets generally. And today we're going to talk more specifically about a few motets. But before we do, I'd like to start by talking about a project you're working on for the Church Music Association of America, the CMAA called the Parish Book of Motets. Listeners Mm -hmm. might be aware of the CMAA's Parish Book of Chant, and this will be a great companion to it. We had in mind a general use book that every parish choir could have floating around in their choir rooms, gradually making their way through all the motets and thereby building up a steady supply of motets they can sing really well for their parish liturgies. And, you know, this type of book was really common in the 20th century. I think of, for example, the Oxford Collections and the Chester Book of Motets, or even things like the Pius X Hymnal or the St. Gregory Choir Book. And, you know, it's generally fallen out of favor with the rise of CPDL over the last 20-ish years. It seems like something that is perennially useful for choirs, especially if they're currently drowning in printouts from CPDL. You know, you've come up with a great list of motets that are going to appear in the book. And I'm wondering if you could take our listeners through your thinking behind that lineup. You know, what were the things you considered in terms of text and topic? And what were the musical criteria you thought about? Sure, yeah. I mean, the thing with CPDL, as uh, someone who, like most church musicians, has spent hours and hours in the course of my life scrolling through CPDL pages, <laughs> yes. um, that it, it's really good if you know what you're looking for, that if you have a particular piece, there are often very good additions there, but if you don't know what you're looking for and uh, um, you're looking for a motet for Pentecost, um, there's all sorts of pieces, many of which are completely useless. Uh, you spend a lot of time looking at a piece that has the wrong voicing or it's too long or too difficult. Um, and so this is the the use of these anthologies. And I've learned a lot of pieces over the course of my career from uh, flipping through anthologies like the Oxford books and the Chester books. And so the idea is to have a repository of pieces that are um, achievable by a choir that's perhaps just starting out. Um, where perhaps there's not very many singers um, on a part, the kinds of choirs that don't have a lot of tenors and basses, and so you can't have a divisi in those parts, and you can't have uh, extremely rangy high tenor parts, which are an issue in a lot of Renaissance music. 
Um, but trying also to have the kinds of pieces that you can use um, maybe on multiple occasions through the year so that uh, um, we have pieces for uh, Christmas and for Pentecost and so on. But uh, in this book, what we have are pieces that are um, somewhat multi-purpose. And so things like uh, motets that are on Eucharistic texts, um, on Marian texts, texts from the Psalms. Um, so things that you can have in your repertoire that use a few different times throughout the year as you're kind of solidifying and building up a collection of motets that uh, you sing. And uh, thinking as well in terms of some things that have multiple uses. Uh, Lassus has a setting of uh, Shio Enim, which is I Know That My Redeemer Lives, the famous text from Job. Um, and this, of course, has a lot of uh, liturgical uses, thinking about the resurrection, um, but it's also a very useful piece for funerals. Um, and so pieces like that where there's uh, maybe a few different uses where uh, you can have this book and uh, have some kind of multi-purpose repertoire. You know, I, I, it seems to me that repetition of these motets is is so important in building up the choral sound. And, you know, I know that you direct a, a scola with a lot of pro singers. What, what's your experience in um, coming back to a motet? You learn a motet with your choir. And, you know, in my experience, it always sounds better the second time. And you, you sometimes wonder why something that was hard before is just working magically now. And it, it just seems to glue so much, come together so much better. Yes, yeah. And I mean, even with very experienced choirs or with professional ensembles, um, it's good to have a core repertory of motets that uh, you can come back to. Uh, certainly, at least um, having motets for particular times of the year that uh, you come back and it's Palm Sunday and you do a particular uh, Passion Tide piece or, or something like that, that uh, you're not just completely randomly uh, picking different selections, but that you're choosing repertoire with an eye to. Um, adding things to the repertoire that will uh, come back and will continue to kind of uh, settle and improve themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this is the sort of thing, it's that kind of very uh, difficult to describe a sense of just feeling like you really know the piece, that the piece is uh, uh, in your body, in your voice, um, and that uh, therefore you can tune and you can be expressive and uh, you're not just uh, bringing it off the page, which if you have great singers uh, who are very good sight readers, they can bring things off the page. But often there's a kind of unsettled quality to that mm -hmm. um, initial reading that it needs a few runs and perhaps multiple performances over the course of years before it really kind of solidifies. Right. So let's talk about some of the motets in the book, starting with Citivit Anima Mea by Palestrina, which is, of course, the secunda pars of the very famous Palestrina motet, Siku Tervus. Could you tell us a little bit about the history of dividing motets into prima and secunda pars? And, you know, what's the liturgical reason for doing so? Yeah, well, there's a lot of these uh, double motets or two part. I mean, in many cases, more than two part. There's motet cycles where you have uh, whole sequences of, for example, indulgence to prayers or sequences of uh, Marian motets or sequences of antiphons from the office. And so there's this long history of writing uh, sets of motets, uh, usually as a pair, prima and secunda pars that go together. And sometimes liturgically, that's because the two halves are um, a responsory that uh, something like the uh, Palestrina Tuus Petrus, which maybe a lot of people might know, uh, where you have the first half, you are Peter, um, and upon this rock, and so on, and then uh, the second half, the, the two halves are taken from a text in the office where there's uh, um, a refrain that comes back, and to you I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and then in the second half that comes back again so that there's some shared music. Um, and this, of course, is very useful pedagogically, that uh, if you have a choir that already knows the first part, uh, you can come back later and you can teach them the second part, and it has some music from the first part that they already recognize. Um, and so, for example, in the Parish Book of Motets, there's uh, uh, Exultate Deo by Scarlatti, um, which has two short parts, and there's an Alleluia at the end of the first part that repeats in the second part. Um, and so there's this liturgical practice that it's coming out of uh, texts from the office that have repetition schemes or uh, indulgence to prayers. Uh, Our Father and the Hail Mary is a very common pair of motets that you'll see uh, set together. 
but also that in this kind of repertoire building that we were just talking about, that uh, that can be a really good way to build on repertoire that your choir already knows. So could you tell us a little bit more about this uh, Secunda Pars of the um, Palestrina Motet? You know, what, what was its place in the liturgy, this particular motet? Sure. Well, this is a text from the psalm. So, uh, secret chevus, uh, as the deer longs for the water, uh, so my soul longs for you, O God. And then the second part uh, just continues with the following verses. My soul is thirsting for God, uh, even for the living God. When shall I come and appear before the presence of God? And uh, liturgically, this is... Uh, belonging to the Easter Vigil, that uh, at the Easter Vigil, when you have all of the readings from the Old Testament before the Gloria and the organ blares and so on, there are those canticles in between which can be sung uh, like a responsorial psalm, or they can be sung to the tract uh, chant melodies. And so the last one is a secret chervus with all of these psalm verses, Sita Vidani Manea, and so on. So you can use it in that way, and uh, we've done that at the oratory, but uh, you can also use it just more generally um, as a piece for communion. You could use it on a Sunday where that psalm is read in the lectionary, and so there's a lot of possible uses here. Right. So can you tell us about the relationship of this secunda pars harmonically to the prima pars, and maybe a little bit about the um, melodic relations too. Are there some of the famous melodic motifs that appear in the prima pars in the secunda pars, or is it inverted some interesting way? Yeah, well, I think the two halves are very much uh, complementary to each other, which makes it very interesting when you uh, hear them one after another. That secret chervus is almost uh, the quintessence of what you think of as the palestrina style. It's very imitative, all the lines kind of overlap. Um, with the motives, whereas in Sita Vidana Mamea, you have kind of a mixture of imitation and uh, block chords, that uh, the voices come together in more of a block chord homophony kind of texture, uh, to say things like, uh, when they said to me, where is now thy God, which is this very sort of evocative ending, um, is this very kind of plangent, you get this F natural or E flat, depending on what key it is, a lacrime, my tears, <laughs> yeah. which comes in in the alto part, and which is a great kind of expressive moment. Right. And so, especially if, if you know the prima pars really well, which uh, our choir does, and our congregation recognizes that piece, uh, when you go on and you do the secunda pars, there's kind of this emotional intensification because now there's more variety of texture. It's a little bit more kind of extroverted in the way that it responds to the text. And so it's a very beautiful kind of continuation of uh, music that a lot of people know really well. That's really interesting because it's not usually a style that we associate with Palestrina. We kind of think of him as this eternally serene Roman <laughs> mm -hmm. and associate yes. those sorts yeah. of, of plungent things with Victoria or Bird. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so Palestrina has more range than you might uh, give them credit for. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit also about a motet you've got in the book by Healy Willen, by first starting with a little bit about Willen. You know, could you tell our listeners a little bit about Willen's biography and work and maybe what might Catholic musicians find both beautiful and useful in his work for use in the Mass? Yes. Yeah. Well, Willen was the dean of Canadian composers of his time. And uh, for me, working in Toronto, of course, Willen is a figure that looms very large in the world of Toronto organists and church musicians, uh, to the point that there was actually a postage stamp um, <laughs> at, the, at the choir I was at in, uh, in Rochester when I left. Um, as a gift, they managed to find a copy of the Healy Willen commemorative postage stamp oh, and great. framed it for me. So I, <laughs> So I have that in my office, the uh, the will and postage stamp. But because I mean, I'm never going to be on a postage stamp. But Healy Willen got his, uh, his postage stamp. There's still many years does. ahead, Aaron. <laughs> but uh, I mean, he was someone who was a very eminent figure. I mean, he had very high profile commissions. He wrote symphonies and piano concertos that were recorded by. Uh, major artists, but he was also uh, very faithful as the music director of uh, St. Mary Magdalene, which was a very high church Anglican uh, parish, and still is. You can go there and uh, enjoy the lovely acoustics and the organ and the will and tradition that they uh, maintain. But it's a very kind of uh, exemplary um, instance of somebody who was uh, an extremely gifted musician who did not have to be doing 
a parish ministry on a shoestring budget, but uh, who was very faithful for about 40 years to uh, developing a program which was just uh, completely suited to the liturgy that they had at that church, uh, to the acoustics, to the capabilities of the musicians. And so there's in Willen's music and in his uh, kind of example as a liturgical musician, uh, you have someone who was uh, in a particular place and working with what they could do, which uh, if you go to St. Mary Magdalene, the organ is way in the front of the church and the choir is way in the back. And so you can't ever uh, do anything with organ accompaniment at that church. It's completely yeah. impossible to coordinate the um, organ with the choir. Yeah. Um, and so he's writing basically entirely a cappella um, music with an eye to other things that were going on in the liturgy as well. And so the, uh, the chant, the readings, the uh, way that the priests would uh, intone and the pitches that, that they needed to uh, sing at in order to sound good. Um, he had this idea of a kind of uh, real musical unity and flow um, across the liturgy. And so this is music that is very well suited to a particular tradition, um, but that's also just extremely well written and extremely uh, reflective of a kind of very undemonstrative and attractive spirituality. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about the vocal style in Willen's Oh, How Sweet, Oh Lord? That's the motet you're including in, in the Parish Book of Motets, you know, and perhaps why, you know, these lines are just so, they, they, they're like hand in glove for parish choristers, it seems. Yes, yeah. Well, Willen is somebody who, uh, he was always working with amateur singers. He was never working with professionals. And uh, in fact, not only did the parish not have money to pay professional singers, but you had to pay him <laughs> to be part of his choir, that uh, there was a fee to, oh, wow. <laughs> join, the, to join this choir. Yeah. And uh, Was that a common uh, model I... in, in that time? <laughs> well, I mean, I've been in some parish choirs where there was a... Uh, sort of nominal fee to pay for robes or photocopying or whatever. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not completely unheard of, but, uh, was it, I, I, I mean, was it more, it was, uh, more Anglican style? <laughs> I just, I'm imagining this going over, not like a lead <laughs> balloon in a, in a Catholic choir. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it was just that he was so kind of charismatic and, uh, uh such a renowned musician that, uh, People wanted to come and sing mm -hmm. for him. People who could have been paid uh, to sing in another choir instead paid to sing for him. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's a, that tells you something about uh, the particular uh, charisma and ability of this uh, yeah. musician. But uh, it meant that because it was always very much a parish program and an unpaid program, he was writing with an eye to... Uh, what singers could do. And so you, you, in general, don't have very big ranges. You have a fairly kind of achievable tessitura. I mean, there are some big pieces by Willen for like double choir with children's choir in the loft and so on that uh, are much more ambitious. But uh, when you think about the liturgical music he was writing uh, for St. Mary Magdalene, it's very singable and uh, very, very carefully shaped vocal lines. Uh, I always find that uh, when you're conducting Willen, it sort of shapes itself. You don't have to tell the singers a lot about dynamics and phrasing, uh, partly because it's written in all the crescendos, but also because the lines just sort of move up into a higher register so that you naturally sort of bloom a little bit in the voice. Um, it gets a little bit more intense, it recedes, it moves down into another register. And because he knew what the voice could do and uh, what the best registers were for soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and so on, it just comes off the page very nicely. It, it tends to lie in a way that's very comfortable and very logical. That seems to be an interesting counterpoint to someone like the works of Howells, you know, where um, you have that same sort of natural approach that you can apply in uh, dynamics and phrasing and shaping and whatnot, but Willen is just so much easier. <laughs> just much easier, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, could you tell us a little bit about Willen's harmonic language in this particular motet? Yes, well, Willen was somebody who spent a lot of time with Gregorian chant. They have a long tradition of Gregorian chant in English, at St. Mary Magdalene, that reflects Willen's engagement with trying to figure out how to make the chant tradition work 
in the English language, um, but also thinking about how the chant modes might work for uh, uh, for English and for modern music. And so there's a very interesting kind of uh, combination of uh, modal harmony that's coming out of the study of chants and a little bit of a more modern sensibility that comes from maybe the English music that he would have known. Uh, Willen moved to Canada from England, and so he comes out of that kind of a Stanford, Elgar, uh, kind of late 19th century English tradition. So there's a very interesting way that uh, there's some things that sound very kind of timeless and kind of neo-Renaissance chant inspired. The bars are often different lengths, so it has more of a flowing chant rhythm rather than a like, standard time signature. Um, but you also have something about it that's very modern. So it's it's a very kind of unique and characteristic um, harmonic language. Right. And what's the text of this motet? Yeah. So the text is from the uh, from the office for Corpus Christi. This is, Oh, how sweet, O oh Lord, is your spirit, uh, for you have shown your sweetness unto your children. You have given them uh, the bread from heaven. Um, so this is a text that, uh, of course, already exists in the Catholic liturgy. It's just an English translation that reflects his own particular, of course, pastoral needs, that this is a place where they're doing mostly um, English in the liturgy, as as most of us do in the parishes that we serve, um, but also using the ancient uh, liturgical text. Right. One last motet we'll take a look at today is Josquin's Tu Pauperum Refugium. And Josquin is a master of using texture to structure his motets. Can you explain a little bit of how he does that in this motet and perhaps why structuring polyphony in this way makes it more enjoyable for both the singer and the listener? Yeah, well, Josquin, of course, is one of the great masters. And uh, we've just had this whole uh, Josquin commemorative year. He died in 1521. And so in 2021, there were all these Josquin festivities and a lot of the pieces were performed. Um, and some of those uh, festival performances are online. But Tu Pauperum Refugium is kind of a good example of what he does on a very small scale, because this is not a terribly long piece. And you can sort of see him doing what a lot of composers at the end of the 15th century were doing, which is alternating a full choir with little duos. Um, and so you often have these uh, pairs of voices that are singing, um, and then the full choir comes in and says something, and then there's another section with paired duos. Um, and so this is a common technique from the time. And certainly with the typical parish choir, this is very useful pedagogically, because uh, if you're maybe used to singing alto and being buried in the texture, singing the common note, um, now suddenly you're much more audible because you sing a little duo with a soprano or with a tenor. And so it can encourage those sections to maybe put themselves out there a little bit more and be a little bit more uh, melodic in what they're doing. And of course, it gives the singers who are not in the duo or a rest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's also, there's a real kind of clarity of that texture, that the text is very clearly audible, that kind of Renaissance humanism that you want the text to uh, to come through with its syntax and its uh, meaning. Um, and so for the listener, this can be very kind of um, clear and uh, transparent in, in a way that maybe a completely imitative motet by Palestrina is not as immediately transparent in what it expresses. Right. You know, and just speaking historically, you know, the reason that Josquin is composing with these different textures is that, you know, the main structure driving and the main element of structure previously in earlier motets was the underlying structure and melody of the cantus firmus that you were taking from a chant. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, Josquin is working with entirely new materials, so he has to have some way of structuring the text that sounds distinctive and and clear, right? Yes, yeah. So, I mean, this is a big structural shift that, uh, and it's something that you see particularly clearly in Josquin compared to some of his contemporaries. In the Book of Motets, we also have music by Pierre de la Rue and by uh, Compère, who are people from the same period sort of writing in this style. But Josquin is particularly kind of... Uh, insistent and maybe a little bit obsessive in the way that he tries to bring out the text. If you've heard uh, big pieces by Josquin, like the Miserere, um, where he sets this long text from Psalm 51, Have Mercy on Me, O God, um, all of these 
little motives from the Psalter are set extremely carefully in a way that the accentuation of the text is respected, that there's a very clear motive for each line. Um, and so there's a way that Josquin, um, whether it's his own particular personality or whether it's the kind of Renaissance humanism, he's extremely kind of engaged with the details of the text at a very kind of granular level. And so that's something that makes that music uh, unique to him. Right. So, you know, so many people love Josquin, but the, the real question is, if you're a parish music director, is there a lot in Josquin's corpus of motets and masses that the average parish choir can tackle? Yes. Uh, so the answer is no. And <laughs> this is a like notorious problem with, I mean, this music of the late 15th century, if you just pick something off the shelf, is often extremely difficult to get off the page. And part of the problem is ranges that, of course, like a modern alto singer, is not really a category that they had in uh, in Renaissance music. These would have been all male ensembles. Um, and so usually the uh, top voice is either boys or falsettists, counter tenors. Um, the contratenor and tenor, the what we would think of as the alto and tenor parts, are both sort of in a tenor range, and often the alto part ends up being extremely low. Um, so you run into range problems, but you also run into extreme uh, difficulty in terms of rhythmic complexity, um, in terms of contrapuntal uh, complexity, in terms of the kinds of very complicated canons that Josquin often has in his masses. And Two Papurum Refugium is actually a good example of a piece that you might skip over because it, it's the secunda pars of a longer motet called Manus as tu Domine. And the first part is much harder. Mm -hmm. So if you were just sort of looking through the collected works of Josquin, you would probably skip over that Manus as tu Domine because it's rhythmically very kind of squirrely and difficult to figure out. Um, but then there's the secunda pars, which is much more achievable. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, with these two-part motets, um, maybe if you learn that secunda pars, you could go back in a future year and uh, tackle that prima pars once you know Josquin a little bit better. But uh, Tupac Prima Fugium is a good place to start. And of course, the, uh, the famous Ave Maria by Josquin is also achievable, a little bit more difficult than that. But mm -hmm. uh, there, there are a few pieces like that that are within reach for parish choirs. Can you name a couple of others? What would you say about other mm -hmm. things that might be achievable? Yeah, I mean, with Josquin, I mean, the Ave Maria is achievable. Tu solus qui facis mirabilia is another one. That was in the old Chester books. That's a piece where Josquin is writing in the style of what was called at the time the Elevation Motet that uh, at the time of the consecration of the Eucharist, when the host is elevated, they would sing these very kind of uh, stark um, settings of text in honor of the Blessed Sacrament, which are almost like just block chords with fermatas, very kind of reverent and very stark and uh, uncomplicated. Um, and there's a number of pieces like that. That particular piece is not in the Parish Book of Motets, but uh, Pierre de la Rue's O Salutaris, which is a piece very much in that mm -hmm. style, um, is in the book. So that uh, Tu Solus Qui Facis is a piece that is within reach. There's also a three-part setting of Ave Verum Corpus by Josquin, which is uh, definitely singable by choirs. Um, the piece that I love and uh, really enjoy doing of Josquin is... Uh, uh, in Violata, um, beautiful Marian motet. That's one with five voices. So you need two tenors or a low alto or something like that. And uh, it's a little bit more difficult, but uh, it's so beautiful that uh, it's worth the extra effort. That's one of the, the glories of that style of music for me. So, of course, this is on the, the nerdier side of things, but I think that we have some nerdy listeners. <laughs> you know, it's really an art to get this music to look beautiful on the page. And, and anyone who's perused CPDL copiously knows that there are some things that look like, you know, a Bastion Primer piano book on there and things that others, uh, other pieces that are just so beautiful looking that you are just invited to sing them on the page. So I'm wondering if you could share with our listeners just a little bit about, you know, what kind of software are you using, some things about you know, how you consider the spacing of things or size of notes in relationship to, to stave distances and all those sorts of things? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm working on Sibelius, and I've been 
I mean, for many, many years, because I've done a lot of motet transcription, I have my sort of uh, set up ready to go here and sort of try to set it so that the staves are not too close together and all of that stuff. I mean, what I've found just as a general thing is that uh, it really is worth me uh, spending the time to produce something that looks good and is clear and that doesn't have too many note mistakes. I mean, I make a lot of typos in the text that my singers make fun of me for, but uh, <laughs> it's it's worth me spending an hour to make a new transcription of something rather than spending 10 minutes in rehearsal trying to figure out notes mm. that are wrong in some edition that I downloaded from somewhere. And, and Because now that 10 minutes is not just my wasted time, but it's all the singers' mm -hmm. wasted time, and uh, it's, it's confusing and it's kind of stressful. So th this is a uh, this is a big thing. My, my predecessor at the oratory used to say that CPL is making better musicians out of all of us because you have to look at the score and try to, try to figure out what happened to produce this wrong <laughs> note. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I say that not not wanting to bash CPDL. I mean, I've got some editions on CPDL, and uh, there's some very good uh, materials on CPDL. But, I mean, what you recognize in the people who are doing the best editions on CPDL is that, I mean, they're transcribing from a good source. I mean, they're, they're transcribing either from the original uh, source materials, manuscript or print, or from some kind of authoritative early edition. There's been some amount of proofreading that's going on, and sensible layout and spacing and all of that good stuff. So when you're working with Sibelius, I mean, if, if let's say that you've got, you know, a 40 bar motet or something, what are some time saving tricks you use to actually get through that um, amount of a making of an addition? And because, you know, we're all very busy church musicians, and I think you more than most, how are you able to fit that in? Do you have specific tricks that you use to be able to really get through something and then proof it? quickly yes yeah well I'm, I'm all about the keyboard shortcuts because Sibelius is extremely time-consuming to use if you're clicking each individual note with the mouse um, so I've gotten to the point that very quickly with keyboard entry because I'm transcribing from part books um, you can mostly set it up so that your part book is on one side of the screen Sibelius is on the other side of the screen you're transcribing straight through with uh, keyboard shortcuts for the notes and rests and then you go back and you do the alto of course, I've also got my setup with the shortcuts that I want for things like the breathe and like note values that mm. you don't use a lot in modern music, mm -hmm. but you, you use all the time in Renaissance music transcription. Um, so I've sort of got my like basic template that uh, I can open that has the names of the voices for uh, the parts that I want and the spacing set up the way I'd like it and the font and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, just a, another follow up question. When you're looking at the part books, um, you know, are are you often transposing into what you know will work best in your choir? You're using original pitch. I'm often transposing, yes, and and this is the big struggle when you're dealing with uh, Renaissance music editing, of course, because uh, most of these pitch pitches in the original sources are designed for uh, low voices, uh, mm -hmm. fairly low bass. The soprano is maybe a sort of alto-ish countertenor range. And so usually you end up having to transpose up a little bit, and then it becomes this balancing act. Because if you transpose too far, now the tenor is super high, the tenors aren't going to like you. But if you don't <laughs> transpose up far enough, then the altos are singing low E's and F's. Now the altos don't like you. Um, and so it almost becomes this war between uh, like how angry can I make the altos in, in, order to avoid making the, in order to avoid making the tenors more angry with me. It's a kind of <laughs> battle of the sections. Right, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. This has been really helpful. Can you recommend to listeners a website where they could go to hear about your music program, which is really outstanding? Sure, yeah. Well, we're on uh, www.oratory-toronto.org is the uh, oratory website. Um, and we're also very uh, active on YouTube. There's uh, recordings of uh, uh, talks and uh, various conferences and so on, but also musical selections, organ music, uh, choral music, chant, and so on. Uh, so if you search for Toronto Oratory on YouTube, you'll find a lot of our stuff there as well. Well, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And I yeah. think, you know, you have so much to share with our listeners. So I'm really grateful that you took some time to be with us today.
Uh, always great to be here. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Dr. Jennifer donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of his glory. <laughs>